Professor Cole is the Richard P. Mitchell uh, Endowed uh, Professor at the University of Michigan in the Department of History. He's been there for almost 40 years, he's been teaching. Um, he wears a number of hats, but I'll just kind of show, in, in at least from what I know in terms of its chronology, how, is he, how he's evolved into the, the, the public intellectual that he has now become. Um, I, he's a, a former professor of mine, I'm a former student of his. I took a number of different classes with him. I took a Mughal India class with him. Uh, I took a class in uh, Middle Eastern history, um, early Middle Eastern and modern Middle East, Eastern history with him. And I absolutely loved it. Um, you know, for those of you, we've mentioned University of Michigan a couple of times already. If those of you who are there right now or are thinking about going there, you need to take his classes. Um, so right around the time of the Iraq, of the Iraq War, the American War uh, invasion of, uh, of Iraq, uh, Professor Cole was noticing that the type of, uh, of presentation of what's going on there on behalf of the US media and the US government was not exactly what he was seeing when he it was reading the media down on the ground in Iraq. He speaks multiple languages, which includes Arabic, Persian, Urdu, and many others. Those are just the ones that are relevant for us uh, in, in our, as, as Muslims. Um, and so he would actually translate things, documents, television uh, interviews, and so forth, and put them on his blog. He started this blog in, in uh, I think, 2002 or so, about 20 years ago. Um, he started getting notoriety for that because he was presenting a more fuller picture and so I'll introduce him in, in the sense that he is arguably the most um, fair portrayal of the Muslim community both in the US and worldwide in US academia anywhere. You know, there's probably no other person that has done more for the Muslim community in US academia in my opinion. And he's right here in, in, in Ann Arbor. Um, so he, he knows, he's very well versed in all parts of the Muslim world, going from Morocco to Malaysia. His topic today is going to be the Pakistani floods, the, 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 uh, all the problems that we're having there from uh, an environmental standpoint, why it's happening from a climate change standpoint, and the politics that might be informing that too. So without further ado, I'd like to have Dr. Uh, Cole come up and uh, we'll get started. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Majid, for that very kind introduction and uh, 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 for your kind words. Uh, I want to talk today, uh, and, and Majid and I discussed uh, what, what, I should, uh, what I should focus on, uh, about uh, the uh, flooding in, in Pakistan uh, from the point of view of uh, climate change. I, I teach a course occasionally uh, at Michigan on the, on the history of climate in, in the modern era. Uh, and um, what happened, of course, is so horrible, it's hard to imagine. Uh, and um, uh, I know there may be people in this audience whose uh, relatives uh, uh, or, or friends have been deeply affected uh, by these uh, events. Uh, and I apologize, I'm going to step back and talk about them in an analytical way uh, to, to try to make sense of what's going on. Um, so uh, uh, it's widely recognized that these floods are unprecedented. Uh, UN General Secretary uh, Gutierrez uh, said that, quote, I have seen many humanitarian disasters uh, in the world, but I have never seen climate carnage on this scale. Uh, and uh, something on the order of 33 million uh, persons in Pakistan, uh, which uh, if you figure a population of 220 million, it's, it's easy to see uh, that 16% or something of the population have been affected by these floods. Uh, and so many people have been displaced, uh, have lost everything, have, have lost their homes, uh, have lost their farms. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's an incredibly destructive event that we haven't seen so much of this uh, uh, scale of destruction in, in contemporary history. Now, before 
the impact of uh, global climate change, of course, there was always a monsoon. I, I lived in Pakistan uh, uh, in, the, in the 80s, and I remember uh, uh, monsoon season, uh, the, the trees would almost bend all the way over in the wind, and rain would come down like buckets for uh, an hour or two, much worse than what's going on out there today. Uh, and, and so it's, it's not new to have a monsoon. Uh, monsoon develops in the South Asian weather system, uh, typically from a low pressure area in the Bay of Bengal uh, and over in the Arabian Sea. And it's a system that affects not only South Asia, but uh, also Africa. Um, uh, but it, uh, what a low pressure uh, system does in, in the weather is, is that it, it, uh, it means that the air is rising. Uh, pressure is low below, so this, the air is going to be pushed up. Uh, and as it goes up, the air accumulates moisture. So there'll be clouds and then ultimately there'll be rains. Uh, and um, uh, I once uh, was looking into whether to do some research in the summer in, in the archive at, uh, in Maharashtra. Uh, and. Uh, I, I looked up the weather and I saw that it was raining all the time in Mumbai in, in the summer and that didn't seem very attractive to me. But it was because it, it's part of the monsoon comes to it uh, from the Arabian seaside. And you can see from this map that I'm showing you that uh, the, the heavy rain is, is, the, is the polka dots to the east, you know, Bengal and so forth. And then in the Cone and northern India, up, up uh, to Uttar Pradesh and, and, and Kashmir, uh, you have a lot of rain, but not, not quite as much as in the east. And then traditionally, Pakistan was getting less than 10 inches. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't getting the full brunt of the monsoon. And obviously, this year, that changed. It changed so much that uh, Scientists were amazed when they looked down on Pakistan from, uh, uh, from the satellites uh, that uh, there was a whole new body of water in the world. There was a, a sea in, in Sindh and Baluchistan uh, that was 67 miles across. It was a major body of water. Uh, and uh, it will take as much as six months for it gradually to drain away. Uh, so this is, a, this, is, this is a lost year for uh, people who lived in that particular area. Uh, Sindh and Baluchistan received 784% and 496% of their average rainfall this season. So it was something uh, that, that people just haven't, haven't seen on that scale. There were, were huge floods in, in, in 2010 as well, uh, but this was even worse. Uh, the losses, uh, again, these cold statistics don't uh, convey to us the entire uh, horror uh, for ordinary people, but a million homes destroyed. And remember, in many Pakistani families live many people in a home, uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's a lot of people. Uh, uh, 1.2 million head of livestock killed. Uh, I believe the statistic is that in uh, certain districts of Sindh and, and Baluchistan, as much as 80% of the livestock are dead. Uh, that's a lack of meat, that's a lack of, of, of protein, that's a lack of milk uh, going forward. Uh, Eight million people were displaced. You know, in the entire Syrian civil war, which again was a, a horrible tragedy and, and your heart goes out to those people, uh, we think about 11 million people were displaced from 20. 11 uh, until the present. Uh, so this one event displaced almost as many people as the entire Syrian civil war. 15% um, of the rice crop was lost, 40% uh, of the cotton crop. Those are very key crops for Pakistani agriculture. And uh, there is now, you know, the aftermath of, of this flooding and, and this destruction is that there is a, a severe potential for malnourishment going forward. Uh, there is a lot of malnourishment in Pakistan already before the flooding. Uh, it's estimated as many as 40% of Pakistani children uh, don't, don't get the full complement of vitamins and, and uh, nutrition that they need. 
uh, and it's going to get even worse now. And then there's a threat of disease, of, of cholera, and, other water, and some waterborne diseases, uh, uh, dengue fever, uh, and so forth. Um, and it's going to cause people to be pushed down into poverty. Uh, two million households at risk falling into extreme poverty. Uh, and uh, uh, again, that's, that's quite a large proportion of, of Pakistanis, uh, it's several million people. Um, the damages are in the billions, you know, 15 billion in uh, damages, 15 billion in economic losses. So, um, coming to my, my subject here, why is this happening to Pakistan? Uh, why, is it just a, a one-off weird thing that happened and now it's over with? Uh, no, it is very likely that uh, it happened because of, of human-caused climate change. In fact, some climate scientists have estimated uh, that it was 33% more severe than it would otherwise have been because of the changes that we've made to the climate. Uh, carbon dioxide, uh, methane, nitrous oxide, and water vapor are all greenhouse gases in the sense that they, they trap the heat and they're in the atmosphere in, in, in a certain quantity. They trap the heat on Earth. Ordinarily, the, the Earth is heated by the rays of the sun. Uh, those will strike the, uh, the planet and warm it. But then they radiate back out to space. So, you know, if you've ever been in a desert in, in, at night, you, you get cold. It's because the, the sun rays have already radiated back out. But the carbon dioxide and those other gases and the water vapor, they keep the heat here. They don't let it radiate back out in nearly uh, to the same extent. So um, over time, uh, the Earth is heating up. And uh, this is caused by us driving gasoline cars, uh, by using coal for electricity and, uh, and, and fossil gas for, for heat, building heating and so forth. Um, from the late 19th century, uh, there's been already a 1.2% uh, temperature increase, which is causing these climate phenomena that we're seeing. Uh, and um, that doesn't sound like very much, uh, but uh, it's about two degrees Fahrenheit, and it's an average of the entire surface of the entire Earth. So, you know, the oceans are often cold, uh, and, and as, as you go deeper into them, they get very cold, and uh, the uh, uh, mountains are cold, and you've got glaciers and the Himalayas, and the average of all of that has gone up. So in any particular place, uh, like Phoenix, Arizona, or Hyderabad, Sindh, the temperature has gone substantially more than that because it, it makes for the average when you average it in with the cold places. Uh, and the parts per million of carbon dioxide have gone uh, to 418 parts per million. For all the time that human beings developed civilization from about 10,000 years ago, uh, after the last big ice age, the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was fairly stable. It fluctuated around 260, 270 parts per million. We can tell this from ice cores. We can tell it from phyloplankton uh, skeletons. And now we've almost doubled it, uh, just in a very short period of time. And this kind of big increase in carbon dioxide has happened before in the world, but uh, it, it took millions of years and it was mainly because of a lot of volcanic activity. Human beings themselves, just by burning all of this petroleum, uh, all of this coal, have, uh, have upped the uh, parts per million. And the last time in, in history that we know of that the parts per million were this high, uh, uh, was three million years ago, at which time the entire Earth was tropical and there was no surface ice and there was about a third less land mass because it was under the water. And that's likely where we're going if, if we go on like this. Uh, it'll take centuries, of course. 
Uh, there's also a warm water feedback loop. Uh, when the oceans are, are warm and the air is warm, more water evaporates from the oceans. The air is capable of carrying more, more water. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, rainstorms become much more severe and, and the potential for flooding is much greater. Uh, and, and then the, the water vapor itself is a greenhouse gas and so it keeps the heat on the earth uh, and, and fuels these storms. Um, so uh, a climate, uh, climate scientists uh, have, have argued that uh, the five-day monsoon rainfall over the provinces of Sindh and Baluchistan uh, was about 75% more intense than it would have been without the extra warming. 60-day uh, rain is, it was about 50% more intense. So I have a little bit more to tell you about, uh, about climate change in, in Pakistan, and I want to open for, for questions and answers, and there's some semi-political issues we can get into about what to do about this and who's responsible, uh, but I think we should break now uh, for Esha, and uh, we'll come back and pick it back up. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, I thought I'd uh, uh, just finish up a couple of these slides and then we can open for a discussion. Um, the, the thing I was going to say is that the, uh, ordinarily the, the, the big depression is, uh, the, the low pressure zone is in the Bay of Bengal, uh, but there's also typically one in the Arabian Sea. And this year, uh, the, the Arabian Sea uh, depression was enormous compared to normal times. There had been very high temperatures in that area in the, in the summer, um, in, in Basra and uh, some, some cities of Iran and also in uh, southern Pakistan. You saw temperatures as high as, as 122 Fahrenheit, 50 degrees Celsius, which, you know, that's uh, what it gets to be in the Mojave Desert in California, among the, the, the hottest places in the United States. And that contributed to uh, Arabian Sea uh, uh, low, low pressure zone, uh, which then brought these enormous rains to southern Pakistan. Uh, and as I showed you in the earlier map, usually they stop in, uh, in, in Maharashtra and Gujarat. They don't come all the way up to southern Pakistan. This year they did because of the intense heat. Uh, and the Indian Ocean uh, is warming faster uh, than the average uh, rate of warming throughout the world. And this is one thing that we have to understand with climate change is that the world is not smooth. Uh, there are some areas that warm faster than others. The Middle East is warming fa twice as fast as the average. The Arctic up in the North Pole is, is warming four times as fast as the average. Uh, so the Indian Ocean is one of those areas that's warming uh, faster than the average. And those warming waters are putting more moisture into the atmosphere because of uh, uh, evaporation, and then the warm air is able to hold more water. Uh, and uh, they also make the winds that blow over the uh, Arabian Sea more erratic. And so those winds are coming to Pakistan in a way that they, they didn't before. Uh, and. Um, so then, you know, when we're talking about a massive problem like this, it's necessary to think a little bit about what can be done, what could be done about the future. We, we can't stop the world uh, from, uh, from warming entirely. Uh, if we can move the world very quickly to carbon zero, so we're just not burning fossil fuels, we're not using gasoline in our cars, we're not using uh, coal and gas to fuel our power plants. If we can do that by 2050, a lot of the extra carbon dioxide that is in our atmosphere will be absorbed by the oceans. The oceans are a carbon sink. Uh, and so things will immediately stop warming as soon as we can get to carbon zero. Uh, but if we go on putting the fossil fuels in the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere after 2050, we'll reach a point where the oceans can't absorb it anymore. And then it will just get hotter and hotter. Uh, so the next 20 years really are going to dictate the fate of the Earth. Uh, and 
Uh, one thing we have to think about is then resiliency uh, uh, measures to, to live with this change that's, that's happening to us and is going to hit our children and grandchildren even harder. Uh, one thing to note is that it's very unfair Pakistan should suffer so heavily for this phenomenon because Pakistan is estimated only to be responsible for about 1% of the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. That was emitted by the old, early industrializing states, by Britain and the United States and France and so forth. Uh, and uh, as a result, many are calling for climate justice and saying that Pakistan should be given debt relief to deal with this uh, flooding crisis by the uh, countries who have loaned Pakistan money and who uh, were primarily responsible for the uh, extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that contributed to this disaster. Uh, and I think that we're going to hear more and more of that. I think it's a fair argument. And I think the uh, early industrializing countries like the United States are, are going to have to pony up. Uh, there's going to be a sense of uh, restitution uh, going forward. Uh, Sri Lanka has the same problems as Pakistan, being there uh, in the uh, Indian Ocean. And uh, its government has put in early warning systems and uh, using climate modeling to see those years when it might be especially uh, affected by uh, changes in climate. Uh, Pakistan doesn't have such a system at the moment. It needs one. Uh, if you can warn people that it's coming, uh, there are things they could do to, to get through it, even just leaving the most affected areas beforehand, uh, early warning systems and so forth. Um, some countries have much more insurance available, government-backed insurance for uh, farmers in disasters. So a lot of these uh, Sindhi farmers or uh, people in Baluchistan and, and southern Punjab, they don't have insurance. If their farm gets washed away, those, it's just gone, and they have nothing. Uh, this is something that only the Pakistani parliament could put in as government-backed insurance uh, for people uh, to deal with these. Uh, one of the natural features uh, in, Paki in, in Pakistan that could help deal with some of this flooding are wetlands, natural wetlands, like we have in, in Florida. Those wetlands uh, are, are malleable and they can absorb up to 40% of a flood. Uh, but people have been clearing them, they want to farm on them, they've been cut down. So the government needs to protect the wetlands that exist and maybe expand them back to where they were. Uh, I know there's a big tree planting program in Pakistan. Uh, many of the prominent politicians are uh, uh, backing it. Uh, that also will help, it helps with cutting down on erosion uh, in, in the flooding. Uh, and then engineers can design floodplains, they can design uh, drainage systems, they can design uh, you know, levees uh, with, with sandbags uh, that deal with some of this, uh, this flooding. Uh, my impression, uh, I'm an outsider, but I'm a, my impression is that uh, Sindh has been somewhat neglected with regard to infrastructure. And so that's, again, something that the Sindhi provincial government the, and, the, and the central government of Pakistan is going to have to undertake. Those are things that only a government can do. The infrastructural projects, that's not going to come from individual volunteer labor or uh, even from very wealthy people. It's something the government has to undertake. Uh, and uh, so people wanted me to talk about po politics. And that's the one political thing I will say is that the Pakistani government needs to get its act together because this flood that happened isn't the last one that's going to be like that. And Pakistan's uh, prosperity and security are in danger from these phenomena. The government is going to have to deal with them. Uh, and just in the same way that it takes a military threat seriously, it's going to have to take the damage of climate change seriously.